there, my name is Ollie, and in this video I'm going to show you how the abstract factory pattern works by walking you through a real world problem it was created to solve and how it would solve it. But before I get to any code, let's talk about the abstract factory pattern. So what is it? Well, it's a creational pattern that allows a family of related classes to be constructed without knowing what those final classes are. This pattern is very similar to the factory method pattern, except that an abstract factory will contain more than one factory. Each method will return an object designed to work with the objects returned by the others. Let's say we have an application that lets its users create and manage their content, including having the content output in multiple formats. The best way to achieve this would be to store the content in blocks based on the elements that make up the content itself. Because of this, you'd have a class to represent each different type of element, like the heading class. Headings have a body, the heading text itself, and a level. Heading levels are typically used to define a hierarchy. Every level 2 heading belongs to the previous level 1, every level 3 belongs to the previous level 2, and so on. You'd also have a paragraph class. In reality, a paragraph could contain links or styling elements for bold, italic, underline, strike through, etc. But I've purposely left that out of this example because the complexity required from that would take us away from the primary purpose of this video. As I mentioned at the start, this system will output the content in several standard formats. Right now, they don't have a way to output anything, so we'll need a method. Let's say, get output. Since it is a required method, we won't just add it to these classes. Instead, we define a shared interface, which would be called block. Then we'd need to implement it, starting with the heading class, and then the paragraph class. Now, let's say we have this content that has been pulled from a database or some other data storage. Somewhere within the application, there would be a method like this that takes an array of data along with an output format and then returns the content. The first thing this method would need is an empty string to start the output. It then needs to cycle through the content. Each iteration will need to create a new instance of the appropriate class based on its type. Then if the block isn't null, it needs to append the output to the previously created variable. And finally, outside of the for each loop, it will return the output. There are only two types, but this would need to become a switch statement when support is added for other elements. This code is also error prone because it's just assuming that the correct data is available. And while in an ideal world that will always be the case, there's always a chance that it isn't. So this code will need to have checks. First, it will need to check there's a body for a heading and pass null if there's no level. Then it will have to repeat the same body check, but for paragraphs. Now that this is more robust, you can see that it's starting to get quite lengthy and complicated. Imagine how bad this would be if we had support for links, images, and the other elements a system like this would support. This is where factories come in. Rather than have the validation and creation logic all in one place, you'd abstract each block's logic into its factory. You may choose to use factory methods in the same class as output content, such as this make heading method. While this could work, as you add support for more elements and more formats, more block types, you're going to have a huge class that becomes hard to read and manage. The best way to solve this is with an abstract factory. This abstract factory will start with an interface called block factory. Since we only have headings and paragraphs right now, it will have factory methods for each of those. Then we can create an implementation. Let's call it HTML block factory because that's the only output format supported right now. Then we can move each type's logic to its factory method. The output content method can be simplified to use this abstract factory. First, it will need an instance of the factory. Then the body of each switch case can be updated to use it. This is now much tidier and much easier to follow, with the logic for each block abstracted out into the factory. The only issue is that this should support multiple output formats, but it only supports HTML right now. This is where abstract factories shine because the HTML block factory can be swapped out with any other instance of the block factory interface and the code will work. With one exception, the output is currently hard coded as HTML. Fortunately, that's relatively easy to solve. First, we'll go to the heading class, make it abstract and remove the get output method. We will then create a new class called HTML heading that extends this abstract class and then add the removed get output method. We then do the same with paragraph, make it abstract and remove the get output and create a class called HTML paragraph that extends it and has the removed get output method. 
Finally, we can go to the HTML block factory class and ensure each factory method creates instances of these new classes instead of the old abstract ones. We don't need to change the output content method because this will work with these changes. So let's create new classes, but this time for markdown. We can start with markdown heading. The heading level will correlate to the number of hashes used in markdown, so we will repeat the hash for each level. Unlike HTML, markdown also needs new lines after these block elements so that they don't get joined together. Now we have the markdown heading, we can create markdown paragraph. The only thing required of a paragraph in Markdown is a single line of text surrounded by new lines. Now that we have these two Markdown classes, we can create a Markdown block factory, which will be identical to the HTML factory, except that it returns these new classes instead. Finally, we can go back to the output content method, and instead of using one hard-coded factory, we can swap based on the value of the format parameter, and then it will just continue to work as intended. This is a fully functional implementation of the abstract factory pattern, but there's no need to stop there. You'll have noticed that the logic for validating each block is duplicated, so you could create an abstract class called base block factory that has methods for this. Then you'd have your factories extend this and call these methods in place of the validation. You could even introduce a static factory method to the base block factory class that creates an appropriate factory instance then your output content method would call this new factory method. There are many different ways to take this, with several different combinations of the abstract factory and the factory method patterns. It's down to what you need and what you like. As always, remember that since design patterns are templates and guides, you're free to experiment with them and see what you can do. There's plenty of room to do so. And that marks the end of this video. This has been a walkthrough of the abstract factory design pattern, what it is, how it works, and the problems it was designed to solve. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks for watching this video. If you're interested in seeing more, remember to subscribe. And as always, if you have any feedback or questions, you can reach me on Twitter, Discord, or by email. Happy coding.